Hey, everybody, good morning. I just want to say thank you to The Hill for some great burritos. I've been waiting for two years uh, to have those. It's great to be with all of you this morning. Uh, Richard, I hope you're here. Um, we've got a very packed house. Uh, my friend Richard Besser, if you didn't know, is the former acting director of the Centers for Disease Control, uh, and he was a superstar at ABC News uh, talking about all things health. And this morning, Richard, I want to start out because you, know, you said the other day that until this virus is controlled everywhere around the globe, we're going to continue to see a lot of new strains coming, and that's going to be challenging to us at all. Um, at Robert uh, Woods Johnson Foundation, you have been looking at health equity and the connectivity of health challenges a lot. I want to ask you, is there a price that we are paying in the United States for siloing in national terms our COVID response, our COVID dashboard, our awareness of, of our health fragility? Yeah, uh, well, thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me, and uh, I'm sorry I can't be there with you all in, in, in person. Uh, you know, I think, Steve, when it, when it comes to, to public health response, uh, especially for a, a global event such as this, um, if you're only thinking in nationalistic terms, uh, you're, you're not going to get very far. And uh, we're seeing that play out uh, again and again here as the global response, the control of, of COVID uh, around the world um, has, has not kept up to the control efforts in, in wealthy nations. And so over and over again, you know, one thing that viruses are really good at is mutating. And if, if a strain develops that survives better, that has some kind of advantage, it will spread and become the dominant strain. And we've seen that over and over again. And now with the current strains, we're seeing a lot of people who are fully vaccinated, who've, who've had not just their primary series, but their boosters who are right. getting COVID again. So one, you know, until this is controlled everywhere, we are all, all at risk. And uh, you know, monkeypox, as that's, as that's springing up, is, is again, another scenario. Uh, but one of the things that's clear, I, I ran emergency response at CDC for, for four years. Um, in the early parts of a response, there is a, uh, uh, a great effort uh, by our elected officials in, in Congress yeah. to provide resources. Uh, but as time goes on, and especially as a, as a crisis is ending, the, the will to ensure that, that public health has what it needs to, uh, to be ready for the next event uh, right. in a better fashion goes away. Let me and ask so you. We see these cycles again and again. Sorry to interrupt, but we have such little time. I got to hammer you with all sorts of cool stuff here. But one of the things, Richard, that you've really gotten at over the years, and I'm just at a point where we so need to discuss it, but I'm so sick of discussing it at the same time, is how, what do we have to get out of the way to achieve real health equity in this country? You, you are saying, you know, zip code matters way too much in health outcomes. What's in the way of success on that front? I know this is an obsession of RWJ, but I, I just want to have like a no-nonsense playbook on how we put that problem, which seems ridiculous in the United States of America, to bed. Well, you know, Steve, putting it to bed is, is, is a real challenge. It takes confronting uh, the long history of our nation and how our nation has has continually developed policies that privilege some and create barriers for, for, for others. You know, this summit with a big focus on, on, on health care um, is, is important, but we recognize that health is about much more than having, having access to high quality health care. Clearly, it's very hard to be healthy if, if you don't have that. And in our nation, uh, we were the only wealthy nation that doesn't feel that, that having access to health care is a right. Um, but you also saw many aspects of, of broader concepts of, of equity play out during the pandemic when you looked at who was being hit the hardest. You know, Black Americans, Latino Americans, Indigenous people with death rates that far surpass those of, of, of white people. And it's, it's, it's not by chance. If you look at uh, who was most likely to have uh, a, a job that paid a living wage where someone could decide to stay home if they were sick, who had sick leave, who had family medical leave. These things do, are, are, are not uh, occurring randomly, and we're the only wealthy nation that doesn't see that kind of social contract with, with, with our fellow citizens as something that, that should be a, a right. Look, I know we're, we're going to see that play out in the next pandemic, but we see it play out every single day. I, I know it's not easy, but you know, I, I, I know that um, the pandemic hit certain communities in America so much harder than others. And doesn't that give us a geographic map that we need 
action plans in those communities. Maybe we need um, you know, substantially more investment in those communities to even out um, health outcomes. And I'm just, you know, I, you know, I know it's an unfair thing to give you all the power in the world to say fix it, but I'm just interested in what do we move to do beyond talking about it and actually begin addressing um, equity as a fundamental obsession of the American healthcare system. Yeah. So you know, I, I think that you know, if, if you're looking at data and you're seeing a difference by race, by by geography, by income, you want to then say, well, what is what is driving that? What are the inequities that are in place that are driving that? And what policy approaches could change that? So if if you if 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 you look at you know, you know survival in the United States, life expectancy, if you look at so many different health outcomes. Uh, you'll see geographic differences, you'll see differences by race. And a lot of those uh, states that have uh, the worst health, health prospects also are states that have not expanded Medicaid, uh, are not providing health insurance to, to their population. They're states that haven't expanded or, or increased the minimum wage, so their, their individuals are not getting paid a, a living wage. Those things are things that you can tackle with, with uh, with policy approaches, uh, but there has to be the will to do that. And what we've seen in America, you know, during this pandemic, Congress came together, Republicans and Democrats, and they right, provided right. a lot of support to people, money in their pockets, they provided uh, access to health care, all kinds right. of things, but it was time limited. Most recently, they provided to families an ex expanded child tax credit. Right. They right. reduced child poverty by 30%. Unbelievable that something mm. that simple could reduce child poverty by 30%. But it was time limited, and we've already seen more than 3 million children slip back into poverty right. because of that. Richard, it's, it's, not, it's not like it's mysterious, Steve, but the will to do it is just not there. Fi final question, Richard. Um, some, both on the right and the left, Senator Bill Friss, Lena Wen, others were saying that before the pandemic, we were derelict as a country in investing in public health infrastructure. We did the minimum possible, minimum necessary, uh, so much more needed. Are we wasting this crisis now in terms of setting up the public health infrastructure capacity we need, or do you think we're getting it right? We are definitely not getting it right. You know, since 2003, the, the real dollar budget for the CDC has declined by 50% for their, their emergency preparedness work. Um, and that just can't be if you want to be ready for the next crisis. But, you know, even now, Congress has been unwilling to, to give the administration the dollars they need for vaccines, for access to, to, uh, to, to testing and treatment. Um, that just can't be. You know, if we're not going to invest in public health, we are going to see the same outcome the next time we have a major health crisis. Um, we need to invest in, in technology. We need to invest in people. And we need to change the authorities of CDC. CDC, right. it shouldn't be optional for states to report data to CDC. Right. You wonder why CDC didn't have real-time data? States can choose whether they send it or not, and that just shouldn't be. Well, I want to thank, I have our audience thank Dr. Richard Besser, President and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Follow him on Twitter. You'll learn a lot. Richard, thank you so much. Good to sort of see you. If you hadn't been there, I'd be talking to the chair here. Thanks, Richard. Thanks so much, Steve.